All right, welcome back in. Hope you're doing well today. This is the Detroit Lions 2020 offseason. We're just a couple of months away, we hope, from the start of the NFL season. Hall of Fame games already been canceled, so we don't know for sure when or if the NFL season starts. But for today's video, we're just going to assume that the NFL season will start on time, and, and we'll just see where it goes from there. Detroit Lions struggled on defense last year, as, as you all know if you're a Detroit Lions fan. They struggled a lot. And specifically, I think in, in, in the Lions' front office's mind, they struggled in the secondary because statistically, they were just getting passed on the entire year. Now, I don't know that the personnel for the Lions was actually that bad when you look at last year's roster. I actually thought that last year's roster looked like it should have been a reasonable defense. And, and, and I, I don't know necessarily that you had bad personnel. But the Lions weren't in any kind of a mood to wait another season and figure that out. So what Detroit did, they've made a whole bunch of changes, coaching changes all over the place, most of those in the secondary. They made a lot of personnel changes, most of those in the secondary, and especially most of those right there at cornerback. So we'll start right there where we saw the most changes from Detroit last year. The, the biggest guy who's gone off of last year's defense is Darius Slay. Now Slay was a great CB for you guys for several seasons. Didn't play that good last year. As a matter of fact, last year kind of had a, a pretty rough year, not just a, a down year, had a, a very rough year in terms of pass coverage. I fully expect Slay to play better this year for the Eagles and, and to go back to what we saw from him for most of his career. But he did have a big cap number too. So the, uh, he had a small dead cap number. He had a large cap number and he didn't play that well last year. So it's really easy to see why Detroit let him go, even if they also believed that he sh should come back and have a strong year in 2020. So Darius Slay is gone. Um, are you gonna miss him? Well, let's talk about that. The guy you got to replace him basically ends up being Jeff Okuda. Now, do not expect, and, and no one will, you're not gonna expect Okuda to be as good right away as Darius Slay was for his first few seasons. But I think Okuda has the talent and has the physicality, has the toughness. I think Okuda has everything you need to be a CB1 in the NFL for several years. I can't guarantee that, but that's what it looks like. You hope, as a Lions fan, you hope Okuda steps into CB1 sooner rather than later. Will he be CB1 right at the start of the season? I kind of doubt that. Most rookies can't really do that. But at some point during the season, I would think halfway through or three quarters of the way through, I wouldn't be surprised if he starts getting some of the bigger matchups, maybe not every single play of every single game, but at least starting to get some of a heavier load and taking on some bigger assignments here because talent-wise, he appears to have it. So you're just expecting, you're hoping that he can get that experience very quickly and start to catch on very quickly and have a good year for you. $6 million is his cap number. Cannot guarantee for sure what he's going to be, but you feel like you feel pretty good about him going forward. I think he'll play pretty decent right away. Just not sure if he'll take up all the big wide receiver assignments immediately. The guy who will probably get that is Justin Coleman. Now, Coleman's an interesting acquisition from, I think, two seasons ago. And I kind of laughed when, when I went back and looked at him. I, I did a defensive video two or three months ago on the Detroit Lions, and I didn't cover this at all. Coleman was a guy who basically was a backup his whole career until he came to Detroit. And in fact, Detroit signed him to a pretty large contract, not a massive contract, but a pretty large contract. He's making $9 million this season, having never ever started before anywhere on a regular basis. And he was a starter for Detroit last year. Didn't look great. Didn't look horrible. Didn't look great. It just kind of he was there, he was fighting, he was working. You had to wonder, though, is Coleman the guy who can actually lock down a starting spot? If he's not, you're basically going to end up in half a season or a whole season, you're basically going to end up paying Coleman about $9 million to be CB2 or 3, whichever way you want to designate that. Now, you don't have a lot of other money invested here at CB right now anyway with Okuda and Trufant here, but still you, you have to laugh. And, and the reason I laugh is because in the last offensive video that I made, I questioned the Lions signing of By Ty, the, the left tackle from Philadelphia, who also had hardly ever been a starter his whole career. Started a few games last year for the Eagles, and that was about it. Got a very large contract from Detroit. Now, if you're Detroit, I assume what you're thinking is we have seen in both cases, Coleman and By Ty at left tackle, we have seen something on film that we really like, and we really think these guys have been underutilized, or we think 
in their last season, 2019 for Vitae and 2018 for Coleman, we really saw something there that looks like they have figured it out and they are ready to step up and be starters. In both cases though, with Coleman and Vitae, you see the Detroit front office kind of putting a lot of money out there on two players who have almost never had any real starting experience in the NFL. A little bit, yes, but nothing steady, certainly nothing for a whole season or two seasons or three seasons like we see most free agents getting. So I kind of laughed when I saw that, that Coleman was actually a, a repeat of the same, same kind of idea that you had there with Vitae, investing a lot of money into somebody who really hasn't necessarily shown that they can lock down a starting spot for sure. So you get back to Coleman last year in 2019 for the Lions. Did he play? Yes. Did he play bad? No. Did he play great? No. Did he lock down a starting spot? I'm not sure that he did that. And so when you step into this season and you're trying to decide between CB1, who's going to start, Okuda or Coleman, I expect Okuda actually be able to at least compete for that job because I'm not totally sure that Coleman is a lockdown starter and I feel reasonably confident that Okuda has a great amount of athleticism and talent. And so don't be surprised if by midway through the season, you don't kind of see Okuda starting to get some of the bigger assignments. So that may not happen. Coleman may step up and show us that he is an absolute lockdown starter. And Okuda may take another year to even catch on and really be a quality starter. So you just don't know what to see there. But in either case, I think you have question marks. And in either case, I think you have a chance here to have a good solid starter at CB1. You bring around the Desmond Trufant. Trufant is the guy who, who really is more slot corner, although he can move around the different corner spots. Trufant is a guy who just, he, he is a CB almost by birth. He is a true NFL player, has been a quality starter now for several seasons, going to continue to be that for you, $7 million there to at least cover the slot corner, if not cover other corner, corner spots this season. Really got, glad to have a guy like Trufant here on the team. Trufant has absolutely no doubt proven that he is a quality starter for several seasons now, and you fully expect that out of him this season for Detroit. So no matter what happens here between Coleman and Okuda, you absolutely expect Trufant to absolutely be uh, a lockdown starter for you here. Um, not a Pro Bowl kind of a guy necessarily, although he has a chance at that. Not, not Certainly not an All-Pro kind of a guy, but definitely a guy that you can lock in at the starter spot. So a little bit of question mark there between Coleman and Okuda. Got talent there. Your size is there. Your physicality is there. Just want to see the execution and the growth there. Cap numbers are not huge. You don't have a massive amount of money invested here at CB, but you do have some here. So you want to see somebody step up here and really start to play well at CB. Daryl Roberts brought him over from, I think, the New York Jets for $2 million. Um, I think it was New York. Anyway, Daryl Roberts is not a starter. You would never want him to be your starter, but he has played a lot in the NFL. He has seen a lot of snaps. You're not going to throw a whole lot of Daryl Roberts that he hasn't seen before. More of a slot corner, really, but this guy really steps up and fights. He really steps up and he plays hard. You're never going to want him to be a starter. If you have enough injuries here where Daryl Roberts is the starter, then you're going to start to get worried. But when you start switching to nickel and dime and that fourth CB or that fourth secondary guy needs to get up there on the field, Roberts is the guy. Roberts is the guy for $2 million. Very good value here. If somebody does get injured and Roberts needs to play, you're not going to get embarrassed. You're not going to get exposed. Yeah, he's not as talented as the other guys. And, and, and yes, he is limited somewhat in terms of what he can do. This is a guy here, Daryl Roberts, who really adds to your depth. This is not a sixth round draft pick or seventh round draft pick that you hope adds to your depth. Daryl Roberts is a guy who can step in and play two, three, four hundred snaps for you this season, and you will get your two million dollars worth out of him for sure. Coming down here, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this name. I think it's Oru Warrior. I'm tempted to just call him the Warrior and leave it at that. For $790,000, I think he played a couple hundred snaps last year, 300 snaps, something like that. He looked pretty good on the field last year. And, and I would be very interested in, in seeing him develop and get more playing time, but we just don't really know what he looks like yet. We just didn't see enough of him last year. And with all of the defensive struggles last year, you have to wonder, you know, could he not have gotten on the field more last year? When he did get on the field, he looked pretty good in coverage. He looked like he could handle his own. 
but again, a bit of an unknown there. So right here at CB, I think you feel pretty good. You surely hopefully feel like either Coleman or Okuda is going to step up, lock down CB1. You feel 100% confident that Trufant is going to step up and lock down slot corner. If he had to, if, if Coleman or Okuda were struggling so mightily that you just didn't want him on the field for a few games, Trufant could step up and play CB2 while Robert steps up and plays slot corner. Not ideal when you look at their size weight combinations, but that's something that you could do. So I feel like even if you have an injury here at CB, or maybe even two injuries, or if Okuda or Coleman start to struggle this year, I feel like you have enough players here with experience who have shown that they're not going to get exposed and beaten time after time. I feel like you have pretty good depth here at CB. So I don't think you have a whole lot to worry about with injuries uh, or if uh, one of them starts to struggle, I think you have enough quality guys here at CB, even though I do wonder about maybe that second starting spot, CB2, if you want to call it, who's gonna, who that's going to be and who's going to step up. I think you have enough depth there to where you feel pretty good about CB this year. Safety, other side, Duran Harmon coming over from the, uh, from the New England Patriots. Four and a half million dollars. Now, Harmon is a guy who probably is never going to make an all-pro, um, probably never going to, in the future, make a Pro Bowl. But Harmon's a guy who I think you can count on to be a very solid starter. This is a guy who, at safety, just looks very comfortable, played well for the Patriots. Four and a half million dollars you get. That's a very low cap number, so I think that's a good, start, a good place to start right here at safety. Now, behind him, at the other safety spot, you have Tracy Walker, who, if he starts and plays like he did last year, and Tracy Walker is still young. I think you still have every reason to hope that Walker improves. You also have to worry, is he going to regress? Because sometimes when you have players who are drafted lower in the draft and they have one good season, sometimes you start to see them when they get more and more playing time and more weight handed to them, you also start to see them struggle as well. But if Walker plays this year the way he played last year, and you're only paying him $970,000, you're getting an awesome deal. And what you have here is not the most talented pair of safeties in the world. There's a lot of teams who have a lot better safeties, but you have two safeties right here who you have to feel good about, with Harmon and Walker. And you also have the chance of Walker getting, uh, being, being a younger guy and getting better and improving more as well. So you have to feel pretty good here about Harmon and Walker here as you're starting safeties. You don't have as much depth at safety, um, right here with J. Ron Curse. J. Ron Curse is a great guy to have as your backup safety. Not necessarily a guy that you want to be starting again. This is not the guy that you want to see get a thousand snaps this year. But this is a guy who is a perfect backup. If one of these guys goes down for a month or two, J. Ron Curse is athletic enough to be able to step in at safety, either safety, and be able to cover. He can also roll over and play some CB if you want. If you really get hit extra hard with injuries at CB, J. Ron Curse is kind of a flexible guy who can roll over and play some CB. Decent cover guy, athletic enough, fights enough, not going to be your starter, but certainly a guy here for $2 million. There's good value right there. So it's your safety spot. You haven't spent a lot of money. You've spent basically about $10 million, I think, for all five guys here at safety. So your value there is very good. You've got two, what appears to be two solid starters. You've got one good backup here who I think can back up either safety or who could roll over here to CB. So I like what you have at safety. Do I love it? No, it's not the best safety pairing in the world, but it is solid. You shouldn't be bleeding unless you get hit with a lot of injuries right here at safety. Beyond that, though, you don't have a lot. Still waiting to see if Harris can grow up and develop and, and, and even be a decent backup. We're not sure of that yet. Time out. I'm going to get a chance to cook here. <coughs> Thank you very much. Harris for $940,000. Still waiting to see if he can grow up and develop and, and at least to be a decent backup, but we'll see about him. Got to give a shout out here to Killebrew. Killebrew is a guy, I didn't really know where to put him. Killebrew, I, I, I stuck him here at safety. Killebrew is a guy who played all over the defense last year. Man, he lined up at defensive end, he lined up at linebacker, he lined up at CB, he lined up at safety. He's all over your special teams units. He may have even lined up at defensive tackle at some point last year. Shout out to Miles Killebrew for, for being all over the defense. Not going to get a lot of snaps 
as far as your regular defense goes. But, man, he just plays all over everywhere. Just a very hungry, aggressive guy. And for $2 million, I think there's certainly a spot for him on the roster, even though you probably won't see him at safety really all that much. Kind of a special teams guy. So shout out to Miles Killebrew. I'm going to forget about linebacker here for a minute. I, I, I've told you guys several times over the past few months, linebacker really these days is more part of the back seven than the front seven. But because of a couple of things here at linebacker, I'm going to skip that, come back to it. Move on to defensive tackle right here. Uh, Danny Shelton, I think, is a guy. He comes over from, I think, the, the Patriots and then the Browns before that. Shelton is a massive guy. He's somewhere around 350 pounds. He is a massive, massive guy. And I really loved him when he came out of the draft, I think, in 2017. I thought this guy had a shot to be a star. No, he hasn't been that. He hasn't been a star. And I don't think you're going to, ex at this point in his career, expect him to be that. But this is a guy who is a very solid defensive tackle in the NFL. And when you plug him into your starting lineup, you don't worry about Dennis Shelton. You know he's going to be tough against the run. You know he's going to get some pressure from the quarterback. You know he's not going to make a whole lot of mistakes. You also know that apparently he is, he is a little bit limited. And, and so you're not looking for a star here. But Danny Shelton at $2.8 million to get a starting defensive tackle that you don't have to worry about. You know he's going to play solid. He has a track record in Cleveland and with the Patriots of playing good, solid football every single season. And so you have every right to expect that he can just step right in and be starting defensive tackle for you and, and do that very well. And, and you don't have to worry about what kind of performance you're getting from Shelton. You, you already kind of know what you're getting there from Shelton for $2.8 million. Where the question marks start to come in, and I think they may even be good question marks, but where they start to come in at is right here with Deshaun Hand. Now, Hand uh, came in for his rookie season in 2018. He only started about eight games, but during those eight games that he started, he was tearing it up. He was all over the quarterback. He was good against the run. He looked like he had the makings of a star for years to come. 2019 gets here, and the Lions are hoping to make a push at the playoffs, and Deshaun Hand gets an injury and gets very few snaps. I'm not even sure he crossed 100 snaps in 2019. So we didn't get hardly anything out of him in 2019. Question is, coming back in 2020, you know, you're only paying him $920,000, but what are you going to get out of Deshaun Hand this year? And the, I don't know that the answer, I don't know what anybody knows the answer is, but if you can get the 2018 version of Deshaun Hand, who looked like a star, who looked at times unblockable, who looked like he could get the quarterback almost any time he wanted to, if you get anywhere near that kind of performance, I think your defense could step up an entire another level. If you've got a defensive tackle here, considering what you've got with Danny Shelton already at one defensive tackle, anytime you put four linemen on the field, if you've got a defensive tackle in the shown hand who can get pressure on the quarterback from up the middle, continuously get pressure in the quarterback's face, you have changed the entire look of your defense. Now, there's no way you can expect that or plan on that. You might get another injured version of Deshaun Hand uh, for 2019. You might get uh, 2020. You might get the 19 version of Hand uh, who's trying to recover, who's still a little rusty, who's maybe a step slow. There's no way to know what you're getting out of Deshaun Hand. But if you get that 2018 version, this defense could look dramatically different. And instead of talking about a defense that in, in 19 was horrible and, and at the pure bottom of the league defensively, and you're just hoping they can rise up to the middle part of the NFL in terms of defensive performance, you might actually have a defense that could work its way up into the top 13 or 12 or top 11 defenses in the NFL. And I hate to put that much pressure on one guy, but the way Hand looked in 2018 for those eight games, he was magnificent and, and, and just, just got all kinds of attention from opposing offenses trying to block him. So we'll see what you get. No way to know that. If you don't, if you don't get that kind of hand, if you get the, 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 the injured version or the rusty version or, or just a version that's just not as good, they've also got Nick Williams here, who they brought in for $4.3 million. Nick Williams had a pretty solid starting season in 2019. 
didn't look very good in 1817 or I think in 16 either. Matter of fact, in 1817 and 16, you really weren't even sure Williams should be on the field. He, he just didn't play very well at all. All of a sudden, you fast forward 2019, he, he's playing pretty good. He looks like a decent starter. What version of Nick Williams are you going to get? Well, for $4.3 million, it was worth finding out. I think that's a good acquisition by the Lions there at defensive tackle. So I think right here at DT, you have Shelton, who I think you know is going to be a good starter, good solid starter. And then you have two guys here, Williams, who has shown that maybe he can step in and be a good solid starter. If he's not, you hope that Deshaun Hand can step in and maybe be an absolute star. So you've got two guys there at the other DT spot that you hope you get a good performance out of. And, and statistically, you're likely to at least get one of those guys playing well. So I think you're good at defensive tackle. And surely, even, even if Hand or Williams, if neither one of them actually steps up to be, to be great, you hope you at least have a decent rotation here out of your defensive tackle spot. Beyond that, you have the, the sixth round pick, and I think a seventh round or an undrafted rookie here with Penasini and Cornell have no clue what performance you're going to get out of them this year. They may not even make the field this year, but it's still, I think, a good decision to start mixing in some younger draft picks, even lower draft picks. When you look at the offensive and defensive lines, it's always a good idea to kind of mix in those lower draft picks just so you keep it fresh and you don't have a bunch of aging guys there on the offensive and defensive line. So here at defensive tackle, I think you're in good shape, not great shape. If one person gets injured, you should still be okay. If two guys get injured, like I know you had some injuries last year on the defensive line, then you have some real problems. If nobody gets injured, I think you have a chance here to actually be very good here at defensive tackle, even better than we were last year. You lose Sean Robinson, I don't think you're going to miss his performance a whole lot. He was good at times. He was inconsistent. So I don't think you're going to miss Robinson. I think the decision not to bring Robinson back at defensive tackle was good. Um, I think he signed like a two-year, $17 million deal um, with maybe the Rams. So I think that was a good decision for Detroit not to bring Robinson back for anywhere near that kind of money. Financially here, you have, you're in very good shape with defensive tackle. 2.8, 4.3, the other three guys are all under a million dollars for this season. So financially, you have very little invested again here at defensive tackle, but you do have a chance at having a very good starting rotation. And maybe even with, if, if Ann develops, maybe even a guy who's a star here at defensive tackle. So I think you're in good shape at defensive tackle. Defensive end, I want to start, of course, got to start here with Trey Flowers, man. The guy comes over last year, lights it up, good edge rusher, good against the run. I mean, the, you know, the guy just does everything that a defensive end could do. Is he elite? No, he's not elite. This is a very, very good player, though. This is an outstanding player. Large cap space. $16.7 million. That's a big cap hit for, for, for any defensive player. Are there guys who make more? Yes. Do we see guys uh, who make this kind of money? Do those teams usually go to the Super Bowl? Usually not. Is Detroit going to be able to do it? I don't know. We'll see. But Trey Flowers here is a heck of a player, heck of a defensive end, excellent at getting to the quarterback, solid against the run. It's a privilege to have a guy like Trey Flowers on your team, even after you consider the cap number. Not everybody would pay that. I'm not sure I would pay that. But he's there, and since he's there, you're glad to have him because he really makes your defense respectable from an edge-rushing kind of perspective. Now, I'm going to come back to these two guys in a second. We're going to slide over to the other defensive end spot where you have the Okwara, Okwara brothers, uh, Romeo and Julius. Julius, you just drafted, coming in, I think, from Notre Dame. Don't know what you're going to get out of him this season, but being a second-round draft pick, you would like to think that Julian could play some meaningful snaps this year and at least develop into some kind of a respectable edge rusher on the other end. Can you imagine if Julian turns out to be a good edge rusher to go along with Flowers, it really starts to help out the rest of your defense and, and take some pressure off of them. Now, having two good edge rushers, or even three good edge rushers, does not guarantee a good defense. We saw this from the Chiefs in 2018, where they had three good edge rushers, three guys who could get to the quarterback in Chris Jones and D. Ford and Justin Houston, and they still had one of the absolute worst defenses in the NFL. Having good edge rushers, and this is important, having good edge rushers does not guarantee you a good defense in the NFL, but it sure doesn't hurt, and it makes you feel a lot better when you've got one guy like Flowers 
or maybe two guys in Julian O'Quara, or maybe even three guys with Deshaun Hand, it makes you feel a lot better if you feel like you have some decent starters, which you do at CB and at safety. Now, Romeo still got a chance to see if he develops. He's still a young guy, only making $4 million this season. Still don't know if Romeo can step up and be a solid starter. The hope is if you're Detroit, you, you don't know after you get past Trey Flowers, you don't know who's going to step up and be worthy of playing time at defensive end. You really hope that Romeo and Julius both, that both of those guys can step up and be worthy of playing time and get some pressure on the quarterback. They don't have to be superstars. It'd be great if they were, but they don't have to be. Just step up, um, get some pressure on the quarterback, be solid against the run, and that takes pressure off of Flowers. He, he can kind of be over there at the other defensive end spot and doing his own thing. And if you can get any kind of production here out of the Okwara brothers, then you have something going here on the defensive line at the at the edge rusher spot. Now you cycle back over once you get past Flowers and the Okwaras, and, and we still don't know what the Okwaras are going to be. Once you get past them, Christian Jones doesn't look like he's going to develop into the kind of player that you hoped. He's making $2.3 million this year. He looks like he's going to be a backup in the NFL for the rest of his career. That's not guaranteed. You never know. Sometimes a guy steps up. But I really don't see Christian Jones stepping up here and being too much of a force here at defensive end. So you really hope that Flowers stays healthy. If Flowers isn't healthy, you have nothing but question marks here at the defensive end spot. Austin Bryant. Bryant's a guy who is, is an incredible athlete. He's fast. He's rangy. Uh, he's athletic. He, he can even, he's even athletic, athletic enough to drop back into pass coverage, although he hasn't done much of that and, and probably doesn't have enough experience to do that in the NFL. This guy is a real athlete. Unfortunately, Bryant just hasn't been able to find his way on the field yet for much playing time, and it's almost like he doesn't have a spot in the NFL. We see this with other guys sometimes. He's tall. He, he's a little bit on the thin side for defensive end. You're not sure if he can play well enough in space to move out there to linebacker. So what do you do with Austin Bryant? And I really don't have a good recommendation for that. You just hate to see a guy like that. Bryant's the kind of guy who in college, when you've got an athlete, it's like, man, I can put this guy anywhere and he's going to play well. But when you step up to the NFL, where everybody's bigger and everybody's faster and everybody's smarter and everybody has talent, a guy like Bryant just starts to get lost in the shuffle because you just don't know where to put him and, and where he can create value. So, so for Bryant, only $860,000, I expect him to be on the roster. I still don't think you know what you have here other than a developmental prospect. And my only thought for Bryant would be maybe you can continue to get his weight built up, continue to get him uh, to be in the weight room and just get bigger and stronger and keep him at that defensive edge position and hopefully when he gets bigger and stronger, he can develop into at least some kind of a valuable asset there at defensive end. But you really hate to see a guy who's got that much athleticism get wasted because he, he does. He, he's got all kinds of athleticism here, even at the NFL level. He's got a tremendous amount of that. So summary here on the defensive line, defensive tackle, I think you're good. I think you've even got a chance to possibly be great. Hopefully not horrible. At defensive end, I think you've got one guy here with Flowers who is an absolute lockdown starter and, and, and is a pro bowler. And maybe even if he had a career year, it could be an all pro. After that, though, after Flowers, you start to wonder, what are we going to do at defensive end? Who's going to step up and actually show up at the other defensive end spot? Or if somebody gets injured, you know, who's going to be my backup? We, we really don't know that yet. So that's kind of a weak spot here for the Detroit Lions, I think. Let's talk about linebacker for just a minute. Jamie Collins, uh, making $6.3 million this year. I, you know, I love Jamie Collins. How could you not want a guy like Jamie Collins on your team? I think every team in the NFL, I, I'm really surprised, and I haven't walked over to the Patriots uh, part of the universe and looked at why they let Collins go, but how could you not like having Jamie Collins on your team? He's been a quality starter in the NFL for a very long time. He does everything. Uh, he's not particularly great at rushing the quarterback, but he can do it. He's very good in pass coverage. He's very good at stopping the run. And you got him for only $6.3 million. And I, I didn't even look, and I'm sorry. I don't know if they traded for him. This is a free agent kind of a guy. But for the Lions, having Jamie Collins 
is going to really solidify that linebacker spot that has been a struggle for you for the last couple of seasons. And, and I hate it for the Lions because it's not like they've ignored the position. They forged several draft picks into the linebacker spot, and they just haven't worked out. Um, you've still got hope for a couple of guys, and the guys that you have at linebacker are good athletes, but, man, they just haven't produced. They haven't performed. Now, we'll talk about them here in a second, but with Jamie Collins, you've got a guy here. And, and I don't necessarily care that he came from the Patriots or not. I don't think you get bonus points from coming for the Patriots. What you do get bonus points for is being good and being good for several seasons. And Collins has been just that. And I think the best part about Collins is that he is good in pass coverage. That's what a lot of linebackers are for these days in the NFL. They spend most of their time worried about pass coverage. Who's coming through the middle? What tight end do I have responsibility for? What slot receiver do I need to pass from my zone to the next zone? What running back is coming out on a wheel route? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It just never stops. And, and, and to be a linebacker these days, I think, to me, is more complicated than it has ever been because you have to have your head on a 360 swivel almost. You have to worry about the running game. You have to worry about the quarterback. You have to worry about... Uh, about wide receivers and, 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 and running backs and, and tight ends coming through your zone and also coming out of your zone. You have so much to worry about if you're a linebacker. And Jamie Collins has done that very well for a very long time. And yes, his cap number goes up in 2021 and in 22, so it's, much, it's a pretty big, bigger cap number in those two seasons. But for this season, you're excited about having Collins on the team because he is an instant upgrade to what was a horrible position for the Lions last year. I thought linebacker was easily the worst position on the team last year for the Lions, and probably looking back to 2018 as well, just a disaster at linebacker, even though you put draft picks into it. So Jamie Collins steps up right here, and here's a guy who not only locks down a starter spot, but he's so good, it kind of takes pressure off whoever starts at the other linebacker spot. And in my, in my head these days, the total amount of snaps that linebackers gets basically equivalates to having two starters at linebacker. We, we talk about 3-4 defenses and 4-3 defenses all you want to. The truth is that most NFL teams, most of the time, have shifted over, maybe 55, 60% of the time, have shifted over to zones. They've started putting an extra defensive back on the field. So usually you have five or six, or if you're the Chargers, seven defensive backs on the field a lot of the time. And the guy who's coming off of the field is that third linebacker. And so usually you have two linebackers. Now, with Jamie Collins locking down one starting spot, that instantly makes you better at linebacker. Following him, though, you have nothing but question marks here at linebacker. Um, you just have, you, you know you have guys who can do certain things, but you don't have anybody else that you know for sure can start at linebacker. Um, you have Tavai making $1.6 million dollars. To buy is a guy who is tough against the run, and that's about it. He struggles on pass coverage, and he struggles to get into the quarterback. And, and, and Tavai is a guy that, that's young. You hope he develops. You hope he gets better. You have every reason to hope that, but he also hasn't shown that he can do those things yet. And truthfully, that you can say almost the same thing right here about Reggie Raglan. Now, Reggie Raglan is a guy who I think comes over from Kansas City, and you get him for only $890,000. So... For $890,000 to have Reggie Raglan as a backup, who is a pretty solid athlete, who isn't horrible in pass coverage, he, he, he's not good, he's, not, he's also not going to get embarrassed, but Raglan and Tavai both do about the same things. Both of these uh, linebackers uh, are not very good at getting pressure on the quarterback. They are not very good in pass coverage, but they are at least good against the run. So when it comes to the running downs, you at least put them on the field and you feel like, well, you know, on, on third and short, on second and five, on first and 10, if teams choose to run against me on first and 10, I have linebackers on the field to go along with Collins. I, I, I'm not horrible at linebacker anymore. I should be pretty good. Even if my other starting linebacker isn't that good in the pass coverage, I'm not as exposed as I was in 2019 and 2018 because Collins just makes such a difference there Instead of having two linebackers starting and playing who are both horrible at pass coverage, I've got one zone, one area locked up, and that takes pressure off my other linebacker, even if he's not great at it, which he's not going to be. It doesn't look like Tavai or Raglan 
is going to be able to step up and pass coverage, but at least you've got a guy with Tavai who is young. You hope he can get better in pass coverage, and he's solid against the run. Let's move down here to these guys. Gerard Davis, Jared Davis, and I apologize, I don't know which way that's pronounced, $3.5 million. Davis is a guy who's a bit of a superior athlete. When you talk about athleticism, uh, Davis isn't just good enough. He, he's more like Austin Bryant. This is a guy who has excellent athleticism. But, man, he just doesn't do He struggles. He struggles to get on the field. And he, so far, and, and I, I don't mean to criticize the guy, but so far, been a disappointment from where you drafted him for what you hope to get out of him. And, and Davis is a guy who has the athleticism easily to be a starting linebacker in the NFL, but has not performed to that level. Now, the one thing... The two things, the one thing, the two things that Davis does really well. Davis is really good at getting on the edge and getting the quarterback. Does an excellent job of it and holds up well against the run. And yet when you drop him back in the pass coverage, which as a linebacker, that's what you spend most of your time doing in the NFL these days. You spend more time trying to drop back in pass coverage than you do attacking the running game or getting the quarterback by far. When you ask Davis to drop back in pass coverage, he just looks lost back there. And that's true in zone coverage. That's true in man. It's just not his thing. Now, my thought is this. Davis is a really aggressive player. I mean a super, super aggressive player. He is downhill, fast forward all the time. And you hate to just sit a guy like that on the bench, especially when he does have good athleticism. And my thought is this. Davis is big enough to wear you could either bring him in exclusively on third and long to get pressure on the quarterback, and basically that allows Collins to sit back here and cover the middle part of the zone. Uh, and I think you could do that pretty well if it was, say, third and 10, third and 12. You put Davis on the field just to go after the quarterback. Also, what you could do, and, and I, I think I would like to see the Lions do more of this, is take Jared Davis, who is good at getting the quarterback and is also solid against the run, and start mixing him in at defensive end, which, by the way, we just talked about. Got a lot of questions at defensive end. Could you at least get him into the mix along here with the Aquaras? Or maybe if Flowers were to get injured right here, uh, stepping up instead of Christian Jones or Austin Bryant. It's just an idea to think about. Now, the, the next question is, is Gerard Davis big enough to be playing defensive end? And basically, he would be a small defensive end. I think he runs somewhere around 6'1", 245 pounds, somewhere in that ballpark. Would he be a smaller defensive end? Yes. But we've seen guys play at that size in the NFL at defensive end, and we've seen some guys play it very well. I think of Dwight Freeney, who I think was even lighter than that, played defensive end in the NFL for years at a, at a lighter weight and did it extremely well. Now, he's not Dwight Freeney. I don't expect him to be, but Davis is a guy right here who, quite honestly, is struggling at linebacker. And so I would love to see the Lions at least try this year to do two things, and that is keep him off the field at linebacker on passing downs unless third and 10, third and 12, you're going to plug him in at linebacker and let him go right after the quarterback. Or the other thing I think you could do, number two, I just talked about it, start getting him into the mix at defensive end. This is one of the guys I think who maybe could benefit from a position change. And, and I think you've got reason to want that position change here at defensive end because after Flowers, you've got guys here with Romeo and Julius who, who, who have a lot of potential. You think they can step up and start, but you don't know that. And so it would be great here, I think, to see Davis uh, step in at defensive end. It's just an idea. Don't know if the Lions have already looked at that or not. But that's just something I stumbled across when we're uh, going across this. One other thing here, I'm just about done. Elijah Lee. Elijah Lee got about 200 snaps last year. Elijah Lee does not really look like the guy that you want starting every single snap of the NFL season. I don't think he's ready to do that yet. But Elijah Lee does one thing well, and that is he drops back into pass coverage very well. He seems to be very comfortable dropping back into pass coverage. So, so my thought is this. You have Tavai and Ragland who struggle in pass coverage and who look much better at stopping the run. So on running downs, and, and you can't always do this because NFL offenses move so fast and they don't often substitute and give you a chance. But where you can, start subbing these guys in and out. And, and the Lions may already be doing more of this this season anyway. 
to buy in Ragland, use them on the running downs, and then when it comes to the passing downs, which would be third and five, second and ten, first and ten, depending on which way you want to play that, put in Elijah Lee and maybe see if, if Lee can get 400 or 500 snaps this year and just drop back into coverage. And he does that very well, at least in the limited playing time that we saw him last year. So while I don't think you have linebacker two covered at the starter spot, I do think you have three guys here who can kind of rotate in and out and play alongside of Jamie Collins here, who is an excellent, excellent starter for you. And I think with those two linebacker stops, spots, you would feel pretty decent about that. And then when you slide over to the defensive end spots here, you have one guy with flowers who locks it down. You have two guys here that you hope one of them steps up and gets the starting spot. And then I think with Davis here, I think you have a guy here who benefit from a position change, at least taking a look at a position change. And if he needs to add more weight for 2021, to be a better defensive end, that's something they can look at moving forward. We covered a lot here. Thank you for listening. I hope you're doing well. Uh, I know some of you have had a rough year, and, and, and so our thoughts and prayers go out to you guys. I hope you're doing well. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye.